Please be seated. Court is now in session. Before we commence the proceeding, Mrs. Zach Kobote, could you report the attendance of the parties and individuals to the proceeding? Zach Kobote, Mr. President, all parties in this case are present except the accused in Sari who is absent due to his health reason. He requests to waive his direct presence in the hearing of the witness TCW320 and TCW428. TCW428 was going to be testified after the conclusion of the witness q and is waiting to be called. The witness confirms through his knowledge he has no relation by blood or by law to any of the three accused, namely Nuji, Insari, and Kisan Porn, or any of the civil parties recognized in this case. The witness will be sworn before the chamber. President, thank you. The Chamber will now give the floor to Nunji's defense to continue putting questions to the witness. You may proceed. Sonarun, good morning, Mr. President, your honors. Good morning, Mr. Witness. As I stated yesterday, I am the National Council for Nunchi, and I only have a few more questions for you. In document E3-438, the co-investigating judges asked you the question that whether you knew of Nunchi's participation in the writing of the Revolutionary Flag Magazine or Youth Flag Magazine. And at that time, you replied that you did not know whether Nun Chi involved in the writing of the true magazines. But you received these two magazines on a monthly basis. My question is the following. Did you frequently read the Revolutionary Flag magazine? Response. Good morning, Mr. President. Allow me to respond to the question put to me by the council. Regarding the flag magazine, I did not read it frequently during the regime. I read it two or three times, and I did not fully grasp the content in the magazine. As I stated earlier, I mainly focused on the technical aspect of my work, so I did not have much time to read the magazine. And the flag magazine, after it, it was distributed to my section. I read it a little bit, but not much. I did not put my attention to the reading or the content of the magazine. And I never finished reading one complete flag magazine. So in summary, I mainly focus on the technical aspect of my work, 
and I did not pay attention much to other aspects not assigned to me. Thank you. My next question is the following. You did not read much of the magazine and you cannot really collect the content of the two magazines. But the question is, can you recall the general format of the magazine? Was it in a book typed magazine or was it a newspaper typed? What was the cover like and what was the color of the cover page? Or was there any sketch or drawing on the cover page of the magazine? Response. I can't recall that there was a symbol of flag on the cover page, but I could not recall the, the color of the flag. As I stated earlier, I did not pay much attention uh, to the magazine. I only focused on my work. I could only recall the symbol of the flag, but I cannot recall how many flags actually were on the cover page. Question. So you cannot recall the cover page clearly. What about the writing in the magazine? Was it handwriting or was it typed? Response. I am not really clear on this point, but I think it was type. And it was not hand written. Because at that time they have the typewriter. And that's all. Thank you. So you are not really sure whether it was typed or written or probably it was likely that it was typed. Can you clear, clearly confirm or verify this point? Response. What I mean is that it was likely that it was typed because at that time, I also repaired the typewriters. And those people who worked in my section, they used the typewriter to type documents. Although I cannot recall clearly whether it was typed, but it is likely that it was typed. And then it would be roller printed And that's based on what I thought of the experience at the time. Thank you. Now if I move to another page of your written record of interview that is document uh, E3 strat slash 438. You were asked whether they have a definition of the word, the bad element, and you replied that you did not know, but when Nunchi 
arrived, there was instruction to stop talking about the 17 April people and stop talking about the new and the old people. And that you did not know what bad elements meant, but people kept disappearing successively. And as far as you understand, if someone was a member of the party or member of the youth league from a network, and if people from that network were arrested, that person would also be arrested. And you also said you was from the West, but you worked with the East people, and those East people were removed, as they were mainly members of the party or members of the Youth League. And you was asked another question that until when that policy was implemented, and you responded that the policy continued, although Nunti did not want you to talk about the separation between the new and the old people, and that the disappearance of people still continued. And as you could understand, the Southwest Zone people were considered as good, and the people from the East and the West were purged. They would be they were replaced by the Southwest people. My question is the following. The word, the Southwest Zone people were considered good revolutionaries, and when the people from the East and the West were purged, they were replaced by the Southwest people. Based on what criteria that you considered the Southwest people were good revolutionaries? Response. Yesterday, I replied to part of this question. Allow me to supplement it. Regarding the removal of the people from my workplace, that is, those from the East and those who replace them, I mean those the Southwest people, and why they were considered a good revolutionaries. During the time that I was living there, I was not the one who could walk freely and knew about all these things. I heard about that from other people who could freely go around. They told me The zone secretary had problem, and for that reason, the people from the east were removed. And when Junjat took over, I only saw those people from the southwest zone. That's how I learned about this event. That they said the east zone people had problems, so they were removed and replaced by the southwest people. I knew while I was working there, although I did not go around and ask people about that.
So when we learned, when I learned that the Secretary of the East Zone had problem, the people from the East were also removed. Questioned. So, upon the removal of the East and the West people, you concluded that the people from the Southwest Zone were good people, good revolutionaries. Why did you make such a conclusion? Because, to my understanding, all revolutionaries were good. Response. The word good or bad was not my own word from myself, but I heard these words from other people, those people who walked around. And while I was at my workplace, I heard from them. And actually, I also saw that at my workplace. And for that reason, I thought. Of these terms, the good or the bad, although I myself did not go around. And of course, I could not know why people were removed or what kind of decision was made by the upper echelon. I saw the East people were removed and replaced by the Southwest people. Thank you. This is my last question. You said you work under the supervision of a new chair toward the end of the regime as two ministers had been gone. How many months did you work under Nguyen Chia? Response. I cannot clearly recall the exact date. When Junya stopped and Nunji took over, it was in late 1978 and until we fled in 1979. It could be from mid-1978. because he took over for a short period of time only. Question. Yesterday I asked you that during the Democratic Cambodia, there were two groups. One was the party and the other one was the administration. And you replied that You heard that Nguyen Chi was the head of the assembly. Is my recollection accurate? Response. Maybe I forget, but yesterday I said he was also involved with the assembly, but I cannot recall whether I said he was the head of the assembly. And I also said that he was a member of the standing committee. Question. For a brief period of time that Nunchi took over at the ministry, based on your record, written record of interview with the OCIJ, that Nunchi became a minister in charge of the Ministry of 
propaganda and information did not didn't you wonder that if he was a member of the standing committee and or uh, the head of the assembly why did he become a minister in charge of that uh, information ministry because the ministry was the ministry was a branch of the government or under the government's administration president witness please wait the prosecutor you may proceed uh, mr president we, we would object this question seems to call uh, for the witness to speculate about the reasons for Noon Che's particular positions. Uh, we believe this is beyond the, beyond the witness's knowledge. Council, the witness does not respond yet, but he did say that he heard that Noon Chi was a member of the standing committee and that he involved with the assembly, although he could not say whether he was the head of the assembly. So my question is to his knowledge, if Noon Chi was a member of the standing committee and involved or worked at the assembly, didn't he wonder why Noon Chi came to take over a ministry which was part of the government? That is my question. President, Council, could you refresh your question? This kind of question is not appropriate. Okay, I'll skip this question and move on. During the time that you worked under the supervision of Anunji for a short period of time, as you stated in your interview with the OCIJ, did you frequently meet with Noon Chi? Did you really know him in his capacity as your supervisor? Response. Yesterday, I touched upon this issue regarding my contact with him. But if you want more of my response, allow me to add. I knew Noon Chia. But I was not close to him. And when I said I knew him, it was in the case that sometimes when I brought the document, I brought it to another person, or sometimes when that person was not in, I brought the document to Noon Chia. But I did not have a frequent contact with him. I did not know about his uh, business. I did not work close to him. And in fact, I worked with other people close to him. I only met him occasionally or sometimes I saw him when he chaired a meeting. And 
and I did not know more than that. Thank you. In your capacity as his subordinate, based on your statement and your interview with the OCIJ, that you knew him indirectly and not close to him. What could you say about his personality, whether he was a cruel person, barbaric, or arrested people and imprisoned people? Was his word rough? Or he was a good person that shall be respected, that he had the spirit of leadership based on his conscience or whether he was a good nationalist and so be respected. Response. I was not in a position to judge him. I did not have sufficient knowledge to do so. But based on the practical situation at my workplace, I could say something about that. But I could not say about his other works outside my observation within my section. At that time, he was a firm person. And when it comes to the food Reason he paid attention to that. Also, he prohibited the people from smoking there. That's based on my recollection. And when it comes to the living condition, he advised people to also get up early and uh, do exercise. So sometimes he walked around and advised people in engaging in exercise in order to keep a good health. That's how I observed, and I could not say anything else about his other ac activities outside my observations. I have no further question for this witness, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Witness. My colleague will have some questions for you. Thank you. National, International Council for Nguyen Chi, you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, good morning to everyone in and, around, in and around the courtroom, and especially good morning to you, uh, Mr. Kyo N. My name is uh, Jasper Pau. I am International uh, Counsel for Nguyen Chia, and I will ask you some further questions uh, based on your earlier statements. I will be speaking slowly for the benefit of the translators. But if you do not understand the question, please do ask for clarification. <clears throat> My first questions relate to the interview that you had with the investigators of the co-investigating judges. 
when the investigator of the co-investigating judges came to talk to you, did he explain why he wanted to speak to you? When I was approached by the investigators, they did not compel me to give interview. They advised me to tell them the truth that I can recall. And today, I already stated I would only speak about what I can recall and where I am not sure I would say so. And before the investigators of the OCIJ, I spoke about the truth that I could recall. And it it was not my intention that I would be I would buy us this side or that side. So this is my confirmation that I gave the interview voluntarily and I actually requested them that I wish not to testify before this court. So whatever the court was arranged, that was the matter for the court. But what I requested to the investigator is that whatever the ECCC is doing or will be doing, please try to unite all the Khmer people. That's all. Thank you, uh, Mr. QN. And let me say that I think it's clear from your statements yesterday and today that you are trying not to speculate and we appreciate that and I would urge you to also not speculate today when I ask you questions. <clears throat> but the question I asked you was a different one and I will repeat the question and I hope you can answer it. Did the investigators of the OCIJ explain why they wanted to talk to you. Do you know how the investigators found you? Did they explain why they came to get your testimony? response. I would like to explain further to clarify the issue. In my own capacity, I did not want to play any role. It all depends on the state whatever they want the country to do, uh, it's, it's all up to them. But uh, in my uh, personal commitment, I simply provided the interview if I was requested. And once I have already provided my testimony, I ask 
the investigator that I not be summoned uh, to testify in person in court. That's what I requested to them. And as to how they uh, found me, it was up to people at the court. I did not know uh, when they uh, interview me. Uh, I thought to myself, wow, if they could uh, have found me uh, somewhere, they knew where I had uh, resided. Uh, so I simply provided them with the testimony during that interview. Thank you, Mr. Kieran. That is part of an answer. I would like to follow up on that briefly. You say the investigators of the court found you. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Did you receive a phone call? Did somebody come to your village, knock on your door? What happened? How did they find you? I would like to add to my previous responses. I do not want to reject answering this question, but in response to that question, it seems to me that uh, It was like the question was asked some 20 or 30 years ago. And actually, nobody uh, knocked on my door, and neither did they force me to answer the question. And uh, the atmosphere of the interview was acceptable by uh, myself and the investigators. I received the investigators, and I voluntarily agreed to provide the interviews, but I only asked them that I did not want to appear in court to testify in person at the time. But uh, when they came to interview me, I voluntarily agreed to do so. Mr. Qn, I understand, and you have stated several times now, that the interview was conducted voluntarily and that you were happy to cooperate. But my question is a different one. My question is, why did the investigators come to you to give testimony? Do you know this? Did they explain to you why they came to you, Mr. Q, and, and not, for example, to your neighbor or someone else? The President, witness, please hold on. Uh, members of prosecution, you may uh, proceed. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Mr. President, you know, we'd object. Uh, this question is repetitive. He's asked this several times. Witnesses said that he does not know why the investigators came. They, did, they didn't tell him, he just, they came and he responded. So I don't understand uh, uh, the relevance uh, and I also think this question has been asked several times and counsel should move on. Uh, it's um, simply not true. The witness has not answered that he does not know why the investigators came. It is relevant uh, because perhaps the investigators told him at the beginning of the interview uh, why they approached him, whether his name had been mentioned in other testimony, whether his name uh, appeared in documents. The reasons for hearing this witness and the reasons for sending out investigators to pile in to question this witness are relevant. And we simply do not know yet, uh, because the witness has not answered yet, uh, whether the witness knows why he was questioned or not. The President, the objection and the grounds of objections are valid 
and thus uh, sustain witnesses instructed not to respond to this question. The interview was conducted in a cafe. Is that a correct assumption on my part, Mr. Kewen? Yes, uh, that is correct. Actually, it was not a cafe, but it was in the uh, coffee plantation. Uh, it was in one area in Pailin uh, province, and it was somewhere in the cafe plantation. They uh, asked me to conduct the interview in that location. And how did they ask you? to conduct the interview in that location? Did they call you or did they come to your house? Response. Before conducting uh, the interview at the cafe plantation, uh, they came to my house They had communicated with me earlier, and they wanted uh, the uh, answer from me, and I voluntarily agreed to uh, have this interview in that location. Uh, they actually asked me to go to a place where we could uh, eat uh, something and had something to drink. But then the interview took place in a uh, guest house. That is my uh, clarification on that point. Thank you. And when they explained that they wanted to get some information from you, did they mention what type of information they wanted? Did they, for example, mention that it was related to the Khmer Rouge regime? Response. The information they expected was relevant to what I had experienced during the uh, three, three years period when I uh, resided in Phnom Penh. So they asked me about what life was like in Phnom Penh when I was uh, in the city. And the uh, questions that they asked were relevant to that period as well. Thank you, Mr. Q. And I will move on to a different topic for now. Perhaps one of my colleagues will want to follow up on this issue. Um, and just to be clear, Mr. Q. N., I'm not suggesting that anything bad happened when you were questioned by the investigators. I'm simply trying to get a picture of the conditions under which you uh, gave your statements. My following question is, uh, another witness that worked at the Ministry of Propaganda has come and testified before this chamber. And his uh, name was Mr. Kim Woon. And the alias of Mr. Kim Woon during the uh, regime of the Khmer Rouge was Chaum. Do you know Mr. Kim Woon? Or perhaps you know his alias, Chaum?
from some cloud. Response, yes, I do. He is now residing in Pailan province, but he worked in a different place. And did you know each other also during the regime of democratic Cambodia? Response. I think that this question was already asked. Yes, I knew him, and even now I also know him. I knew Chao when he was working with Office uh, 33. Actually, he had uh, stayed in that office uh, before I came uh, to join this office. So I knew him from then. And he now lives in um, Pai Lin, Mr. Kim Woon. When is the last time you spoke to Mr. Kim Woon? Response. It appears to me that this question is not uh, relevant, but I will endeavor to answer this question. Uh, when we were in Pailan province, we uh, met each other uh, frequently, but uh, not anymore now. And if you ask me uh, about my communication with him recently, I have never met him. Uh, we actually uh, have met once in a while because we were old friends. Have you met Mr. Kim Woon after he appeared here before the ECCC? Response. After I was uh, summoned to testify in this court, I learned that Chaum had been uh, summoned earlier on, but I have not met him since then. I actually had known for sure that once they uh, ask uh, the former staff member of K of uh, Office uh, 33, then I would uh, be summoned uh, as well one day. But I did not uh, bother to find out what uh, he uh, had been asked uh, by the court. Uh, I simply did not uh, bother to ask him any question relevant to this court. And. How did you find out that Chaum had been summoned? Response. Actually, When I was invited, I do not recall it uh, very well. They might have met with the family members of Chaum. And I learned uh, that news, and I thought to myself that I would one day be asked to come to court as well. And I never contacted uh, Chaum, but I only thought that I would one day be asked. Uh, that was it. I did not uh, bother to find out uh, what uh, had happened to him, but I only knew that 
uh, Chaum, Chaum had uh, been summoned uh, to the court and he had already provided the testimony to the court. You stated that you have not met uh, Mr. Kim Woon after you were summoned to the court. Have you perhaps spoken to him by telephone? Yum. A response. Uh, Chaum actually does not use a uh, telephone. He cannot even ride a motorbike. So he does not hold any uh, telephone at all. And I, did not have, I do not have any intention to contact him for whatever reason. So I never bother to ask him or communicate with him at all. The President. Council, you are advised uh, to move on to uh, different topics and uh, we would like you to, to be uh, mindful of the relevance of your question. If your intention is to um, nullify the record of the interview of the investigators, this matter has already been dealt with by the closing order. We do not want uh, to interrupt you, but we have to be sure that the question is relevant to ascertaining uh, the truth, particularly the question shall be relevant uh, to the segment of trial we are conducting. It cannot be further from my intentions than to want to nullify any proceedings. I am questioning this witness on contacts that he may have had with a witness that appeared before your trial chamber a little over a month ago. This witness has testified on the same topic, which is the Ministry of Propaganda. They live in the same town and they know each other. They have dealt with each other frequently and they even knew each other during the regime of democratic Cambodia. They have worked together. It has nothing to do with any deficiencies in the proceedings. I am simply trying to establish the credibility of this witness. Uh, so with your permission, I would move on with this line of questioning. So yes, you may proceed. But please uh, bear in mind that the witness is now in front of the chamber. You may ask him question. And if, unless you want to seek the nullification of the uh, investigation, then there is no reason why you are asking that question again and again. I do not uh, see the relevance of your question, and the witness is before us now, and you may ask the right question to the witness, and the witness uh, will respond to you uh, directly if uh, you want to ask uh, for uh, confirmation of his uh, testimony. And we would like you to move on in the interest of times, and we hope that uh, the testimony he provides will contribute to ascertaining the truth. Mr. President, once again, I do not try to nullify any part of the proceedings. I'm trying to test the credibility of this. Uh I know that it is not your intention to nullify it, but. Uh, if you ask the question in relation to the procedures in conducting the interview, that is, of course, meant uh, to nullify it. I know the intention, even though you do not expressly mention that, because uh, the question is, your question concerns the procedures in investigation. And now, what we would 
expect from the testimony of this witness is the substantive matters, the matters that will contribute to ascertaining the truths relevant to the accused before us. You may now move on. If it's your position, Mr. President, that I cannot explore the relationship between Mr. Kim Woon and this witness before this witness gave testimony here, I simply cannot proceed. And I would like to have a ruling of the entire trial chamber on this. And I would specifically invite the international judges to uh, give their position on this matter. Because it seems that there may be a misunderstanding. I'm not challenging any part of the proceedings. The President, Mr. Prosecutor, you may proceed. Uh, if, I, if I may just respond to that, uh, a counsel has asked this witness uh, several questions on this already. Uh, the witness has said multiple times that he had no contact with Kim Bun. Uh, I think counsel has exhausted this line of questioning, suggesting that, that he's been cut off from pursuing this as incorrect. I simply think that he's had an opportunity. Uh, I don't see any basis to continue um, uh, harassing this witness uh, when he has said on multiple times already that he had no contact with Kim Bun. And I think it's appropriate for counsel to move on to another line of questioning. I um, beg to disagree. I was just cut off. Uh, I would like to proceed with this line of questioning. And I don't see there any need for use, the use of words like harass. I'm not harassing the witness. I'm asking the witness very straightforward questions in a very polite manner. Again, if I cannot test the contacts that this witness may have had with Kim Woon, both recently and in the past, what's the point of conducting a cross-examination? President, Judge Cadwright, you may proceed. Uh, although the uh, Chamber deplores a direct request to poll the judges, in order to be very clear with uh, counsel for Nguyen Chia, the entire trial chamber agrees with the President's ruling, uh, has deliberated on it amongst ourselves, and can see no relevance in continuing this line of questioning. Uh, therefore, um, as the President has asked, could you please move on to topics that are substantive? Thank you. Mr. Kewen, you have stated that you knew Mr. Kim Woon even during the democratic Cambodia regime. Could you tell us what his role was at the Ministry of Propaganda? Response. I only knew him by the name of Chaum. In K33, he was working with me. But he, he worked separately from me. I knew that he wrote articles, but I did not know the content of the articles that he wrote. But surely he was at Office K-33 during the multi regime. And 
when we left Phnom Penh and until this day, I uh, met him in Thailand, so I knew that he's alive. But he actually worked at that office before I arrived, because when I arrived, he was already working there. So after the democratic Cambodia regime, you said you met with Mr. Kim Woon frequently. Did you talk about your time together at the Ministry of Propaganda? After we left Phnom Penh and until the reintegration with the government, I focused only on the living condition of my family and he himself likewise focus on his family living. And we did not discuss or talk about the past. Let bygone be bygone. We only focus on the present situation, not the past. I understand that you focused on the well-being of your family. You also stated that you met Mr. Kim Woon frequently were those social gatherings did you meet for dinner for drinks at weddings what sort of occasions were those president witness wait the prosecution you may proceed uh, again, we, we'd object on grounds of, of relevance. Uh, uh, there's simply no reason uh, for uh, Mr. Powell to be asking about weddings and social gatherings. Uh, I think this uh, he should return to questions about the, the Democratic Capuchia period. Mr. President, again, since 1979, that is a 33-year time period, these two individuals have met each other frequently. They both worked at the same office. The, witness, uh, the, the defense is simply dubious as to whether these two individuals, individuals have indeed never discussed the time at the Ministry of Propaganda. This goes directly to the credibility of the witness and to the probative value of his testimony. If they have discussed the events during the 75-79 period, that is relevant for you to know. It goes to the probative value of this testimony. So the defense, again, should be allowed to explore this issue. President, the objection on its ground is valid. The chamber or the rule on this line of questioning and that you should focus on the substantive nature of the charges against the accused. But you are still insisting on this line of questioning which is against the ruling by the chamber. And of course the ruling is supported by judges of the bench and the international judge already responded to you but you still keep insisting on this line of questioning witness you instructed not to respond to the last question I note your ruling Mr. President and I will move on to the next question. 
I understand that I'm not allowed to explore this issue further. President, you will not be allowed to continue this line of questioning and you do not need to repeat the ruling again. Mr. Qn, you have stated yesterday that um, the Americans withdrew their Air Force in 1973. Did you ever see American planes over Cambodia in the period 1973 and before that? Response. Regarding whether I saw Americans flying the plane, I did not see that, but I knew the planes were made in America and it flew above the C Cambodian territory. And as I said earlier, my village was burnt down due to that bombardment. This is my brief response to your question. So it was the American planes that bombed your village. Is that a correct understanding of your answer? Whether my statement is correct or not, it is for you to decide. But I responded to your question based on my knowledge and based on what I saw and also based on my current recollection of the event. I um, apologize, Mr. QN. I did not mean to sound that I do not believe your answer. I uh, have no reason not to believe your answer. <clears throat> um, can you tell me what the result was of the American bombardment of your village? Was it slightly damaged? Was it totally destroyed? Let me say, when there was a war, one side would want to smash the other side or to destroy the other side. And in my village, 500 to 600 houses were destroyed. There were only about 100 houses remained. My village was a kind of a concentrated village where houses were close to one another. So when one house was burned, other houses nearby would also be burned. And did people die in that bombardment or had they been evacuated on time? Response. I cannot recall whether people died, but I knew if there were dead, there could be only a few. Because during the night time, soldiers stationed in the barrack and the revolutionary forces 
force people to move out. So the impact of the bombardment or the fight was not that great when it comes to the death. But once again, I cannot put a finger, a figure into the number of the dead. But materially, a lot of houses were destroyed. Only at the furthest end of the village where houses were remained. Okay. Thank you for that answer. I would like to move on to um, the next topic, which is your work at the Ministry of Propaganda. You have stated yesterday that you did not understand the contents of the printouts that you and your section produced. Can you explain to us why you did not understand the contents? Response. The news or information that we intercepted was not in Khmer. It was either in French or English. And I could not read English. I only knew the Khmer language. So I could not understand the content of the news. But through the process of working, I could recognize that uh, one character is missing from a word or something. That is through my observation of the words. For example, whether that word should, has, should have an S at the end. So I worked on those documents, although I could not understand the content of the information or the news. And I stated that as well before the OCIJ investigators. And I only could remember one word or this word or that word and whether the spelling is correct or not but not the meaning of it. And you also stated yesterday that you occasionally gave documents to Nguyen Chia. Were those the same printouts in French and English that you just mentioned? Response. That was the limit of my work. So I did not have other documents to give it to him. So we received the document, including the news, and we intercepted the news, and then we forwarded those news further. And my main focus is technically involved in the intercepting of the news, and that was all. Thank you, that is clear. Yesterday you have stated several times that you focused on your own activities and your own work and uh, you stated that you minded your own business and that you did not put your nose in other people's business. Is that a correct reflection of what you told us yesterday? Thank you.
response. It is correct. Those are my words. At that time, we only did what we were assigned to do. And it would be bad if we put our nose in other people's work. So we tried to avoid that and focus on our assigned work. You state that, sorry, let me rephrase that. You just said that it would be bad to put your nose in other people's work. Did you put your nose in the work of the leaders of the Ministry of Propaganda? Response. I never paid attention to other people's work. I only worried about my work and that I could work effectively and let other people mind it uh, their own business. So the good thing for me at that time was to complete the task that I was assigned to. And that was it. But of course, it would be troublesome if I wanted to get into other people's work. And did you, for example, um, put your nose in the work of Hu um, Nim or Yun Yat? Did you know what they were doing on a day-to-day uh, -day basis? Response. I did not even think of what kind of work he was doing. As I repeat again and again that I was busy doing my work, I did not pay attention to the work of those superiors. I did not even speak to any of them. So I keep repeating myself that I focus only on my work. I did not even think of wanting to know about the affairs of those leaders. Thank you. Um, for that answer, and I understand your answer. Yesterday, you stated that you did not know about the uh, nature of the work of Nguyen Chia. Is that because you did not want to stick your nose in other people's business, or was there another reason? <coughs> Response. Let's say I am a piece of machine then, and that I could function as somebody switch it on. So I only concentrated 
on my work, I, I did not have a subset of mind thinking about other people's work. And when people from my section were removed, there was only I remained. And so I had to do all those work as well. So my full concentration was on my work. And I did not have time to think about other people's work. Except at the time when I concluded my work, I left, then I heard other people talking about this and that. But I personally did not want to, to know or to understand about the work of other people. I hear that you say that um, when you left, you heard other people talk about these things. Do you mean when you left the Ministry of Propaganda after 1979? I don't quite understand your question. What are you trying to refer to that I left work after 1979? I apologize if my question is not clear. You just answered, or at least that is what the English translation provided that um, when you left, you heard people talking about this. And I assume you heard people talking about the work at the Ministry of Propaganda. But perhaps you can clarify for us, um, did you just say, um, when I left? And if so, what did you mean by that? Response. My previous response And your question is kind of not consistent. You talk about when I left my work and whether I heard people talking about things. What do you want me to respond to your question, Council? <laughs> I still simply cannot understand your question and I cannot respond. President Council, could you refresh your question? And make it precise so that the witness can respond appropriately. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I will leave this point rest for now. I think it's a... Um, communication problem and perhaps I will return to it after the break. Mr. Kyuen, uh, yesterday you were asked uh, by the prosecutor um, the following question and I quote from the transcript. It's on page uh, 35 of the English draft transcript. Did you know, besides the role, his role as a member of the Standing Committee, did he have any role at the Ministry of Propaganda?
That was the question by the prosecutor, and he was referring to Nguyen Chia. Your answer was, and I quote, I did not grasp his position when he came, or in what capacity, or that he was in charge of the ministry at all. But in the morning, every morning he arrived, but I did not know whether he was in charge of the whole ministry. I did not learn of that information at the time. Could you explain, Mr. Kieran, why you did not know whether he was in charge of the whole ministry? I said that I did not know because no meeting was held where I attended and spoke about Nunji taking charge or replacing Jun Yad or in charge of the ministry. There was no such meeting. But based on the actual activities after Jun Yad removed in the morning, he came and he went to his workplace and I came to my workplace and worked as usual. And as I stated, sometimes I saw him, sometimes I did not. And I did not know when he left. Because I did not know whether he moved around within the ministry or he stayed on the upper floor. But I saw he came to work. And that was after Junjat was removed. But I did not know whether there was any official document or any official announcement that Nguyen Chi came to take charge. But I only could say about his activities back then. <clears throat> and following up on that answer, Yesterday, you stated um, the following. He could come one day to look briefly, briefly and left, or the next day he would come again. And that's on page 85 of the English transcript. Is Um, let me rephrase the question. Would you say that Nguyen Chia had an irregular pattern as far as work was concerned? Would he come in briefly one day and longer the next day and perhaps not at all the day after that? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Response. Yesterday I responded to a similar question and I would like to add uh, to the testimony I provided earlier. The personality trait of the leader, and it is not confined to only Nguyen Chia, but they normally uh, monitor the workplace. They would go and see uh, people working, and he simply uh, pop up once in a while. That was the uh, general uh, task performed by the leaders. 
And as I said, uh, he pop up in the workplace and sometimes he asked or encouraged people to do exercise and sometimes they go and, uh, to the kitchen and see whether or not they had uh, food uh, to eat or so. So uh, at that time, that what uh, I uh, saw uh, is a visit, but in terms of the lens of his visit, I could not comment on that. But normally the leaders would go and see uh, how people performed uh, their work on a day to uh, that's what I uh, saw at the time. Oh, the President, uh, thank you. The time is now appropriate for adjournment. The Chamber will adjourn for 20 minutes. We will resume uh, at 10 to 11. Court officer is instructed to facilitate the rest of the uh, witness and have him back uh, to the uh, courtroom by 10 to 11. The court is now adjourned. Some Jane Croucher.